Remember the Logitech Harmony remote? A single wand to rule the living room, casting commands to anything with an IR sensor. TV, Blu-ray, amplifier, set-top box, all at your fingertips. With a press, entire rituals unfolded. The screen flickered to life, the lights dimmed, the amp hummed to attention. Futuristic, elegant, and wildly over-engineered in the best possible way. It was the crown jewel of the true home theater enthusiast, or maybe just a lifeline for those tired of explaining the sacred startup sequence. But in 2021, Logitech quietly let it go. The world had moved on to smartphones and voice assistants, to casting and to apps. And with it, the dream of the perfect remote faded, replaced by soundbars smart enough to switch themselves on and dumb enough to forget what made that magic of the harmony so special. Lately, my Samsung TV remote's been giving up the ghost. The super capacitors that once seemed super clever now leave me with a dead remote every other day. I thought about replacing the caps or maybe modding in a battery, but where's the fun in that? Instead, I decided to just build a new remote from scratch because I have a problem. And for this project, I've done a complete tutorial so you can do it all yourself too. I'll take you through the design decisions and show you what it can do. And if you're interested, you can find a link down in the description to the tutorial. Step one was to figure out what features I wanted. So I grabbed a couple of remotes and figured out which features I liked best. Most modern interfaces require a directional pad of some kind to navigate the UI. So that was not optional. I'd also need a back button, a home button and a settings button. I like having a specific mute button, so we'll include that one as well. There's also the obvious ones, your media controls, play, pause, volume, and channel up and down. I also like these shortcut buttons on the Samsung remote. They allow you to open an app instantly, which is really handy if you use any of those apps, which I do not. So I'll include some shortcut keys that I can configure however I want. I also wanted excellent battery life, no daily charging. This meant having room for a decent sized battery in the shell. Since this is something you physically interact with, I started with the shell. I designed a shape that looked like it felt good in the hand, hollowed it out and sketched the outline for the PCB to match. The heart of the build is one of my favorite microcontrollers, a Lolin or Wemos ESP32 dev board with built-in charging. Great for portable projects like this and only a few bucks on AliExpress. I have a bunch in a drawer for projects like this. I sketched out some possible button layouts, played around with some alternate configurations and decided on what I was going for. I laid out all my tactile switches on the PCB with the eventual button layout in mind and added a couple of pull-up resistors. The ESP32 has internal pull-up resistors for most pins, which we'll use where possible, but there are a few that don't have internal pull-ups. So we require some external ones for those pins. Once the PCB was laid out and wired, I generated a 3D model of it, imported it back into the enclosure design and made the buttons. Each button has a flange to keep it in place and is held in place by the pressure between the enclosure lid and the tactile button. I played around with the button sizes and shapes and decided on the layout. Then I added icons to each of them. To print these icons on the button, I'll be using multi-material printing. By combining two colors of filament and a tiny nozzle on our printer, we can create quite detailed designs that are printed directly into our parts. Before ordering the final PCB, I printed a few prototypes. For anything handheld, this step isn't optional in my book. You can spend hours in CAD, but until you hold it, you really don't know what it feels like and it's super easy to lose perspective. A few tweaks later, I had something I was genuinely happy with, so I sent off the order to today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay offers a fantastic PCB production service that I've been using for many years, even before YouTube. You can upload your manufacturing files, select from a list of options, and have your very own custom PCB design shipped to your door in a matter of days, ready to use. They can also assemble your PCB for you, so you don't have to mess around with solder masks and microscopes to assemble your own complex projects. They also offer CNC and 3D printing services, so if you don't have a printer or have a design your printer isn't able to print, you can have it printed on one of their high-end SLS or SLA machines and shipped right to your door. 
They can do everything from CNC machined aluminium to 3D printed stainless steel, all for reasonable prices and with tight turnaround times. It's the perfect way to expand your own manufacturing and making capabilities without having to spend tens of thousands on tools, machines and equipment for your home workshop or business. You can prototype your part at home with 3D printing, then send it off to PCBWay for machining. And with the PCBWay community, you can buy designs from other makers direct from PCBWay and support them in the process, including the PCB for this project. Thanks again to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. While waiting for my new PCBs to arrive, I kept iterating on the enclosure. I figured out how the two halves would clip together and refined the USB-C port area for charging. I went with a couple clips near the bottom and two M2 screws near the top to lock it down securely and added internal stiffness for some strength. A pro tip, for bolt holes with tricky overhangs, I add a one layer roof the printer can bridge. Once printed, you just poke through the thin membrane with your screw no messy supports. After a few days my PCBs arrived from PCBWay and they look great. You might notice I've gone with all through hole components for this design and I'll explain why. These days most consumer electronics use surface mount components wherever possible. There's a few reasons for this, they're smaller, cheaper and most importantly much easier for robots to place and solder in. Unfortunately, they are quite difficult for humans to solder, especially when compared with what's called through-hole components. As the name suggests, through-hole components physically poke through a hole in the PCB and you solder them onto the board on the reverse side, holding them in place. This is worlds easier to do by hand, even if it's a little bit of an older technique. The whole project is designed so you can do it yourself at home. If you have a 3D printer, a soldering iron and a few hours, you can print the enclosure, assemble the PCB, and program the microcontroller yourself, even with no experience. I've done a whole full-length tutorial you can follow. You'll find the link down in the description. You can get your own PCB from PCBWay and all the components for only a few dollars. It's a really great introduction to the world of electronics and is a truly useful end result, which I find much more interesting than a lot of alternatives. I'm using ESP Home to run this remote for easy compatibility with Home Assistant. The tutorial includes a full walkthrough for programming your microcontroller. Even if you're new to this, you'll be fine. And if you hate software, you can just borrow my YAML. I won't tell. Putting it all together was dead simple. There's just 21 tactile switches, two pull-up resistors, and the microcontroller, which is installed upside down on the bottom of the board to save a bit of Z height for the final product. Once I had everything working, I desoldered the battery connector and soldered the leads directly to the board. Not ideal, but it saved space and made the final build a lot tidier. I printed all my buttons on my Bamboo Lab X1Cs using the AMS to print the icons a different color. Because they're quite intricate, it sometimes took a couple of tries due to bed adhesion issues with very small pieces of filament. I wasn't happy with the results from my 0.4mm nozzle, so I purchased this tiny 0.2mm nozzle instead. This gave me much higher resolution and detail for the icons. Once I was happy with my buttons, I ran off a new top and bottom shell in this late 80s electronics vintage scheme of gray and other gray. Then for the last time, I assembled the remote. I dropped my buttons into the appropriate slots in the top of the shell. I dropped the battery into the case and secured it with some double-sided tape. Then I installed the PCB and screwed it in over top of the battery. Then I snapped the bottom of the shell into place before installing the two M2 screws to hold it all closed. And here it is, my everything remote. Great, but what does it do? It does whatever I want it to. Each button on the remote outputs events separately for both short and long presses in Home Assistant, so they can be set up to drive any automations we want. Lights, air conditioning, my TV, anything connected to my smart home. For my shortcut keys, I went with a Plex shortcut, a YouTube shortcut, a resume shortcut, and a random movie shortcut key. 
The Plex and YouTube shortcuts are using this Tizen Samsung TV integration to open the apps when triggered. The resume shortcut will play whichever show we have configured in Home Assistant. The random movie button will do exactly as the name implies. In the background, it just plays a randomized playlist of unwatched movies in Plex. If the TV isn't on, it'll switch everything on first for each of those shortcuts too, so you can go from TV off to your favorite shows in absolutely no time. The buttons at the bottom will increase or decrease the brightness of the lights in the room with each button press. Holding up will go full brightness, holding down will turn them off entirely. With BLE presence detecting, I could even make the remote context aware, different rooms, different automations. The potential here is huge. You could make a simplified version for an older family member who can never find the Netflix app, or a kid safe version that won't let the volume get too high and only allows them to play pre-approved shows. I've provided the step files for a blank version of the remote faceplate complete with a simplified PCB so you can design your own buttons for whatever application you might think up. You can also just use my buttons and add your own icons. The tutorial video includes a guide on doing this yourself in your slicer. This has become a handy addition to our smart home. It's really nice to be rid of that failing Samsung remote and the stupid shortcut buttons we only ever hit by accident. I even find myself using a spare remote to test other automations in a convenient handheld form factor. As we add more smart features to our home, I'm sure it'll become even more useful as we find more applications for it. Now, does it do everything the old Harmony remote does? Well, as long as you can get your device into Home Assistant somehow, yes. There are limitations, it doesn't have an IR emitter, so it won't work with your old infrared components. But the nice thing about this is it's nowhere near as limited as the Logitech Harmony was. You can control a lot more than just your home theater. It's entirely up to what you're willing to put the time into. I hope you liked this video. This was a really fun project to put together and I hope some of you are able to put this together yourself and find your own unique layouts and uses for it. If you have any ideas for alternative uses, leave them down in the comments. I'd love to hear about them and how you might find it helpful in your home. Thanks heaps for watching, and if you'd like to build one of these for yourself, it's a fantastic first foray into the world of electronics and microcontrollers. Plus, if you already have a printer and all the tools, it'll only cost you 20 or 30 bucks to do this project yourself. All the links are in the description of the video or on the website. I'll catch you next time.